Hello, and welcome to another episode in the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Gann. Thank you for joining the show. Um, today's show, which we're recording on October 7th, 2022, I have a great, great, great guest today. His name is Mark Moses. Mark, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thank you, Vance. Great to be here. Good. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about our discussion today. We talked recently um, about your book and the work that you've been doing on municipal governments and really trying to rein in um, excessive spending, excessive overreach, and different things along those lines. Um, so we've got a lot to cover. And um, we know the, really what the Let People Prosper show is all about is um, addressing key problems that are facing people in their daily lives. And one of those key problems is you know, excessive government spending and excessive taxation and fees that have to go along with that, um, that we really need to make sure that we have a good awareness of how our government is spending funds. So I thought, you know, Mark would be a great person to bring on and for us to talk about it. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me go ahead and give you a bio of Mark. Mark Moses has consulted municipal governments in the areas of finance and administration since 2011. Immediately prior, he spent two decades working directly for Northern California cities and other local, local government agencies in senior administrative and financial management positions. His early career was devoted to small business consulting and banking. Mark recently authored a book, The Municipal Financial Crisis, a framework for understanding and fixing government budgeting, which I'll put on the show notes page, in which he applies a moral pro-liberty perspective to the effective management of local government. The book was released by Palgrave Macmillan earlier this year. Mark holds a Bachelor's of Science in Industrial Engineering and Operating Research from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master of Business Administration in Finance from Golden State, Golden Gate University, San Francisco. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. I uh, really want to get into this. We've got a lot of good stuff to cover here, so thank you again. As I like to do with each one of my um, guests that come on the show, I like to start off with, why do you do what you do? What motivates you to get you to the point that you're at today? Well, this grew over time. Very early on, I think I was in my late teens or early 20s. I read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And, and so when I, and I had experience before I went into public agencies, uh, into local government in banking, small business consulting. So I had a certain perspective uh, that I found not many people in government have. And so when I, and I also, uh, you mentioned, yeah, I have a background in industrial engineering and operations research. So that's about streamlining improvements, better operations, and and so I really thought as I went into local government, I would have a lot to contribute. And I was really frustrated by just the, well, in plain terms, just the ignorance when it comes to just basic economics. You know, here I had worked with small businesses that were just operating on a shoestring and they would, you know, float their credit cards to be able to have enough inventory to sell. And, and yet, you know, in the business license department, the concept was, oh, you know, you want to make money, you just start a business. And they they thought these businesses uh, right from day one had all this money to pay for permits and uh, and licenses and, and everything. And so I was really struck by, by that uh, as I entered local government. And over time, I've just watched over the last three decades how local government just takes on more and more. You can call it mission creep or scope creep, but it's just this ongoing expansion. And you know, part of it is uh, is just explicit in the goals. I mean, there I, I cite in the book a number of cities that have a goal of maximizing services. And and when you think about it, what does that mean if you're going to maximize services? And yet your funding comes from taking resources, economic resources out of the local economy. And so, and this is a big difference in the way the culture of local government works compared to the economic realities. Uh, you know, as a finance director, you start with, well, how much money do we have to spend? How much money are we getting in taxes? Don't think about, well, what are the implications of drawing those taxes out of the local economy? And so I guess maybe in the spirit of if you see something, say something, uh, I got motivated over the last uh, several years to call this out. And, and I guess I'll just add one other thing. I was immensely frustrated with what passes as solutions mm -hmm. to local government financial turmoil. 
And I was just watching and frustrated to watch frustrated council members uh, mm. as they were grappling with these situations. So I, I try in the book to put out something that's that's a positive solution and a positive path. Well, and I think you've done a great job. It, it, it really is. And I think that you're able to hit on some of the key issues that are going on. I mean, one of the things that I think with your background, and thank you for explaining you know, more of that there, I think that really will help the audience understand kind of your understanding of boots on the ground <laughs> within local government of trying to see exactly what was going on, what are the problems, and try to figure out how to, how to solve those problems. Uh, but a big part that stood out to me in the reading of the book was you know, that many governments, local governments, are going bankrupt. It's not really whether, but when, when, when this is going to happen. And we really need to start you know, now. I wonder if you could expand on some of that. Yeah, and there's a little bit of a nuance or subtlety there because okay. avoiding bankruptcy, avoiding insolvency is not really the only measure of success. Mm. And so fixating on that can can lead to other problems. So true. So so bankruptcy or insolvency is is one way this problem manifests. But if you remain solvent at the expense of crumbling infrastructure, deteriorating services, passing on obligations to the next generation, that that cannot be considered a standard of success. And so the uh, and so part of what I try to do in the book is demystify this so that the the analysis can be a little more clear headed. I mean, we get so many mixed messages, right? Uh, it, for a city that's on a July first uh, fiscal year, you know, in March you hear, oh, there's a two million dollar deficit, but you have no sense of scale. No one really explains what that means, and it just the number just floats out there. And then by the middle of June, you hear, oh, council passed a balanced budget. It's like, well, what does that mean? You know, what, what does that really mean? Right. And, so the, uh, and then five months later, the financial statements are produced and, oh, we have a $500,000 surplus. I mean, it's, it's this roller coaster, you know, if you follow it and, and just information that, that no one can really assimilate or, or digest. And so I, I try to take a little of the mystery out of how does that happen? What does that mean? Because what happens is people get so desensitized to this. Oh yeah, there's a deficit. Oh yeah. Okay. They balanced it. Oh, okay. They, people give up on trying to solve the problem. Even council members, I think, give up on trying to solve the problem because they resign themselves to, oh, this is just an intractable kind of situation. And so it's, so yes, it is a problem. I, I really believe it is a crisis if you, if you look at it at all long term and in full context. And I think what we're going through right now, if I can touch on it, uh, there is a you know, 2021 federal relief package that would be called a bailout if it were in any other industry uh, that threw $65 billion at cities, part of, you know, I think it's $130 billion total thrown to local agencies. And so that that's helped to prop up the finances temporarily. Meanwhile, sales tax, consumer buying changed during the pandemic and moved from non-taxable services into taxable goods. We've had a lot of migration within states mm -hmm. during and post-pandemic and, and between states that's helped boost some property taxes in, uh, in most of the country. So, but what do all these things have in common? None of them have anything to do with good management, administratively, financially. And so, and they're all one time or cyclical phenomenon. They all come to an mm -hmm. end at some point in, in a cycle. And, and so now, where are we? We've got uh, inflation, recessionary conditions. We've got rising in, uh, energy costs. And people don't realize how much local agencies consume in terms of uh, energy, whether it's electricity for their, their water or wastewater or gas for their, their fleet of vehicles. So all of this is really conspiring to set up a, a, a real existential kind of crisis over the next couple of years. But again, you, you can't just look at, oh, did the city, quote, balance their budget? You have to look at the full picture of mm -hmm. if they did balance their budget, did they do it at the expense of deteriorating services, deteriorating infrastructure maintenance, and, 
uh, and other things that uh, put, well, I referenced pushing uh, right. debt to the next generation that is that is really not success by any standard. Yeah. And, and so there's, I guess, a, a trade off, right? Like in economics, I talk a lot about this on the show of economics is really about the trade off that we have because of scarcity. Uh, we have a scarce amount of time. We have scarce amount of dollars and resources. And of course, the government are they're also limited to that same principle of scarcity, the the thing that's always going to be there with us. And so there are always going to be trade offs if you have fewer dollars that are coming in or if you want to spend more dollars in one area, it's fewer dollars that can go somewhere else. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not an anarchist, so I know that there are there are roles and, and needs by government. Oftentimes they maybe go off in ways that they otherwise shouldn't <laughs> if their main goal should be to preserve liberty and uphold a system of you know, contract law, security, things of those na- things that really allow for an economy to flourish, but also for individuals to have the liberty to do what's going to be in their best interest. But where government oftentimes goes, kind of runs amok, if you will, is when they go in different areas where you see where maybe a, a big one that I've seen here recently, Mark, in, in the Austin area are the zoning restrictions, which those zoning, I know that's not necessarily directly connected to the finances by government, but those zoning restrictions do increase housing prices, put upward pressure on people's cost of living within that community, which can then reduce the amount of taxes that are flowing to the government to to provide the services that they need. I I wonder, was that something else that you might have looked at at the government level, the local government level? Yes, and I'm I'm not a planning zoning expert, but I know enough to know. And there, there are other people out there that are doing good work in this area and pointing out mm-hmm. uh, the, the problems that have been cr- created and sustained through through zoning. But I, I want to go back. Sure. I believe local government creates its own scarcity through yeah. this culture that I made reference to. When you have a, a goal of maximized services, you're setting yourself up for mm. ongoing scarcity. There's never going to be a enough. And one of my, my perspective is the issue, the, the fundamental issue is not that taxes are too high. It's that under the current structure, they always need to go higher Mm -hmm. because there's no end because once you have this vision of an open-ended scope of this open-ended charge to do as much as you can, and your only source of revenue is your local economy. That's where you're drawing your your money from, and unless you use you know other ways to push things off in in time to next generation, which again is another kind of problem, then you're you're always going to be in this mode. And so the only way to really break that is to delimit your your scope of activity to focus on on core issues but uh, the the zoning actually is a good example because by maintaining these old restrictions that basically have made it illegal to build apartments in certain areas and and increase the supply of housing what does that prompt it, it prompts another gro- program cuz now we need a housing department to help us with affordable housing and yep. and rather than go to the cause of the, the of the problem, which uh, is really more based in the zoning restrictions, the cost of development, all the building restrictions that are imposed on on developers, taking that choice away from the buyer, basically saying, "Oh no, you know, eight hundred square foot residence is too small." Well, is that really too small for someone who? only needs that space and and their alternative is to you know live on somebody's couch i don't think it's too small in that case so so all that choice and all that those decisions have been removed and then the result is layer upon layer of programs so then you've got your your local agency is maintaining the the planning and zoning uh function it's maintaining this housing department uh, and then it's maintaining a, a homelessness initiative to to deal with that and I not that I believe that main thing that's driving homelessness I don't believe is is housing I think there there are other considerations there but but that's another issue too when you misdiagnose a problem set up a whole department around a misdiagnosed problem then and you crowd out philanthropic alternatives then you're you're not serving 
your residents and business owners, you're really working against them. Well, that, that's right. I really like the way you put that too, where you have the situation where business is being distorted. There are decisions that are being made by the employers are being distorted by the government officials that are there um, through zoning regulations, through taxes, through other things that are being done at the local level. And I think you know, there's often this, this saying, right, that that government is best that governs closest to the people. And, you know, John Jefferson was a big fan of that. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. The, the problem often becomes, though, when that government still gets out of hand, we need to make sure that they are reined in. Um, I wonder, you know, as we've talked a lot about the problems that are out there and there's a massive amount of debt. I mean, even here in Texas, right, where I'm at, um, I live just north of Austin, Texas, in a place called Round Rock. You know, you see that there are these blueberries uh, in a sea of red, if you think about it in political terms here in Texas, where you have the Houston, the Austin, the San Antonio, Dallas, those types of places where there's a lot of big government spending. Texas is usually known as a fiscally conservative state. Uh, in many ways, it is at the state level as they keep spending you know, in check overall. I, I love to see them spend less <laughs> than what they do and keep taxes lower, but they've done a pretty good job, relatively speaking, to a lot of the other states. But when you look at these local governments, and this is something that I've done some research on, uh, looking at responsible local budgets and compare you know, spending to, to, to some key measures like population growth plus inflation over time, um, what you see is a substantial amount of a burden that's being put on taxpayers because of overspending. And I, I wonder, with your background and the research that you've done and things within the book, what do you find are some key solutions that we can start heading in a more pro-growth way so that we're not spending as much as on the, on the, at the local level or at least spend it more wisely than what we are now? For, well, first, I, I try to establish that the, the current system just is not working. This is – it's not – not working in the present it it doesn't have good prospects for the future it just is not working and so because so many of the solutions or i i call them non-solutions are really just trying to salvage the the non-working system and so once once you're there you have to look at okay what are our resources in the city you know what have we crowded out in terms of of private solutions and philanthropic solutions because it, it's just such a mistake. I mean, I, I would shudder when a resident would come in and, you know, with a local problem, you know, and expecting that, that the that the city could just magically make it go away. And it, it's, I get it in a way because it's tempting because you feel like, oh, I pay these taxes. I want to get my money's worth. But you have to take a step back and look, what is this organization? It, it's a legislative body and it's an enforcement body. And so because of that, it has to operate under certain rules in terms of its you know, public records act and public meetings and all these other rules that are, are really good rules when you're a legislative body and enforcement body, because you don't really want a, an entrepreneurial police department and you don't really want experimental legislation going on at the local level, you know, that with without transparency or or checks and balances but but what happens when the agencies move into these other areas that are that are commercial or philanthropic you've got you're dragging all of this overhead with you that again is designed for good reasons for the legislative and enforcement reasons but but then they they create all these you know whether they're perceived as inefficiencies or clumsiness or ineptitude, but it's it's a foregone conclusion that it it won't go well because you're you're not operating in an area where you can really do justice. And so you talk about municipal utilities. What have they become? They've they've become entrenched in old technology. They they're not looking for new solutions. Your their their infrastructure in general is not really well maintained. Public agencies in general don't even follow environmental regulations as well as private companies because private companies respond very well to threat of large fines. Uh, and some of the regulatory agencies are sympathetic to local government in terms of its financial situation. So, so what do you have? You, you have? You've taken on all these different areas with a structure that really is only built for a small portion of those areas. You're not going to be successful. So I think what really needs mm -hmm. to be done is is to take a step back, inventory all these areas in terms of 
okay, what what truly are we doing that, that only we can do, like the local legislation, like defining property rights, like mm-hmm. I- enforcing the, the local laws? And, and what have we taken on that we've taken on just because we're here in City Hall and people can find us and we've made these promises that we can fulfill all these things? And I think you really have to look look hard at that. And so, but my, the, my real point in the book is that's the discussion we need to have that we're not having. And you can debate about where do you exactly draw the line in terms of what should be under the purview of City Hall versus what should be left to philanthropic organizations or private companies. But you have to look at, and my big example is in the area of municipalities, right? Why do you say, why do you make water a municipal function? Well, we're afraid that a private water company will overcharge residents, it'll have an effective monopoly that it'll take advantage of, or maybe it'll just run the infrastructure into the ground and reap the profits and walk away, or you know, maybe it'll shun and environmental concerns and mm. won't be as sensitive. But look what's happened. I mean, I've, I've worked with some of these municipal utilities and they have all these problems. I I took a proposal, a budget proposal to a, a wastewater organization basically saying there's no need to increase rates. Uh, we have enough revenues projected into the future. There's no need to raise rates. They raised the, the rates anyway just because it was a new budget year and that was the time to consider it. And they came up with all these spurious kind of rationales like, well, if we raise it now, then if something unexpected happens, we won't have to raise it as much in the future. Uh, And so, but again, wait, why is it a municipal utility and and not a private? Because they're afraid of, of spurious raising of rates. Uh, right. But that's exactly what they were doing. And then they were struggling with keeping up with environmental regulations. And they were basically, oh, and then some of the the infrastructure was, was starting to deter. Well, when it wasn't deteriorating, they were kind of over-engineering things because mm. engineers like to tear things down and build them up again. So they would they would just keep these projects going. And yeah. so my point is, all these things that government has taken on in these commercial and philanthropic areas are things that it's not really well equipped to handle. And we're seeing the result of that when it handles these things long term. And it needs to be okay to say, no, we need to to step back from these things. Now, part of the problem is when you've crowded out private solutions for decades, you don't have private remedies on the sidelines waiting to jump in. And so that's something that's going to take time. And just like with the zoning issue, you can't cancel zoning in one day because there are other issues that come up because now you've got to define certain property rights or certain noise restrictions and things that that the zoning might have precluded. You can start to give notice. You can start to say, hey, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, we're going to just be out of this business. And then you can let the solutions come in and deal with these things over time. Because if, if it took multiple decades to create a problem, it's it's not going to be solved by just changing one rule or or implementing something from the outside, it, it's going to take a transition. But those, yeah. those are the kinds of things I, I think need to be done. But most importantly, you need to have a discussion about what is the proper scope of this organization. You have to be very clear on what's legislative, what's enforcement, what's commercial, what's philanthropic, and really look at those in those terms. Because if you don't, then, and I'll just tell you, when you're inside one of these organizations working, it's just a swirl of activity. Hmm. And and then you don't know where to start. Uh, and council members don't know where to start when they're thrown into this mess. It, it, it's almost like there's a compounding effect. Just one problem after another kind of builds up, snowball effect, if you will, uh, breed, breeding about more problems that it's going to take a while to get back out of those problems that you that the government's created in this sense. Um, something that I talk a lot about, Mark, is government failure. There's a lot of talk out there about market failure for a number of reasons. Maybe it's a negative externality where there's an, an innocent bystander that's affected by some sort of market activity that's not priced in the marketplace. Or there's, you know, there's, there's a natural monopoly situation where some will say that the utility should be provided by... Um, the local government. But at the same time, whenever that government entity becomes comes into play and takes over, let's say, water or electricity, um, there's Austin Energy, which runs the electricity in the Austin area. They run into market failure because of some of the things that you mentioned earlier with those trade-offs 
and the um, crowding out of the overall private sector to where they may be concerned about monopolies and other things that are going on in the private sector, but they become they become the monopoly. Well, they are <laughs> the monopoly. No, they are the it, monopoly, it, and it exactly. makes it difficult to to be able to provide competition because they're crowded out the monop- the the competition altogether, uh, making the situation worse. It, exactly, and so from a consumer point of view. You'd rather have a natural monopoly than a forced monopoly because a natural monopoly can be replaced. It can, whereas a, a government monopoly effectively cannot be replaced through the market. It cannot be outperformed by the market, and so and it and it's not looking to innovate. It has it's not looking over its shoulder in any way at competition to that's going to make its services obsolete. Because it, it's basically defined a monopoly over this ge- over that geographic area. So yeah, all these problems that, or or so-called problems that they that that justify and and think about it this way: if let's just say uh, a certain water or wastewater utility was set up on because the other excuse that's given is well, there's not a, enough private sector interest to raise the money. The private sector you know isn't around to to really provide this service, so we're going to jump in and provide it. But think about what the implications of that are. If there's no private money for it, that's you know the market's telling you something. You're jumping ahead of the market as a local agency. And then, okay, if you're going to be consistent, then, okay, do you get out then once there are private, there is private demand to take over this activity? Or do you stubbornly, you know, stay in forever? And and that's the way yeah. these things develop, right? They're, they're justified. And, and this problem happens all the time with like convention centers and, and sports arenas and sports parks. It's like, well, there, you know, there's, this won't work as a private venture. Well, if it won't work as a private venture, you ought to take heed of that information because yeah. you're going off and you're doing something that is doomed to failure. And and we see that, right, with the whole – with convention centers and sports yes. arenas and all that time and time again. The agencies at the time think, oh, you know, they're different. This is really going to be needed. This is a community enhancement. But again, they forget, what are you crowding out when you engage in all this activity uh, and spend local resources on these things that and, and outbid other development? Because now you're constructing something as a city that's that's now bidding out labor and materials that, that would go other places if you if you weren't intruding. Well, yes, that's exactly right. And um, it's... It, and, and no one thinks this way. Right. I guess this was my frustration, yeah. uh, Vance, is no one thinks this way. When right. when they're making decisions and, you know, the and it really frustrated me because what passes as uh, financial analysis or economic analysis or economic studies is horrific. And I'm not mm. an economic expert, but just in what I learned from economics in one lesson, uh, right. you can see, right, just the cause and effect full context look at, at what's going on. You, you can see that these are shoddy kinds of justifications, but the decision's already been made, right? These are political moves. They're, they're, it's not true economic analysis or financial analysis. That's really just to go through the motions and checking a box of saying that you looked at these things. And and so I just say now is time to yeah. declare that, hey, that way of operating is, is not working for us. Yes. And, and to that point, Mark, is that you have a situation where in the in the private market, it runs off of profit and loss, right? And those prices signal to you whether or not you should do something or not, and whether consumers should purchase or not. Um, the prices are so important that you don't have that in this monopoly situation of, of government whenever they impose their will on things. To your last point there, politicians having different decision-making um, steps and preferences is a key part in economics called public choice economics, right, by James Buchanan, uh, where people in the private sector tend to act rationally given the information that they have at the, t- at t- at the time. Um, and as a social scientist, as an economist, I've been studying this for a long time, the only way that I know that you're, that you're going to act is if you act. Um, I could assume some things to try to figure out whether or not you should act the way you do. But still, at the end of the day, you acted doing what you did because the marginal benefit of that additional action was greater than the marginal cost. And so there's a marginal benefit, marginal cost, rational decision making process that's going on. And what Buchanan said in public choice theory was that politicians are also rational. 
They, they also tend to work off of their marginal benefits and marginal cost. But the issue is, is that they have a little bit different rational decision making processes because their marginal benefits and marginal cost aren't just what the, what's best for the private sector, like what's going to help, help them be beneficial out there in the private sector, but also how to get reelected, how to get votes, how to build interest groups and keep everybody aligned together that can allow for these decisions to be made that may not necessarily be best for the people at large. And you, and you see that so much happen within local government that I think you've done a great job of highlighting uh, within your book and, the, and what you just said there. Uh, I wonder if you have some, are there any other key examples that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, well, there's a perspective on that I'd like to share with you because Please. It, 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 it parallels a bit what you said, but it's a little different take. And that's the the organizations over time, These uh, and I'm talking about municipalities, start mm-hmm. to see themselves as an end in themselves, where and when they talk about sustainability, they're not talking about their role as a means to the ends of the residents and business owners. They're they're talking about the the viability of the organization. And then you got to build in because you have to consider the culture because there's a bias towards the status quo. They're trying to preserve the organization as it is uh, with as few changes as uh, as necessary. And so when you look at a, a, a so-called financial sustainability plan. It, it focuses on the organization and it focuses on sustaining the organization with its services, with its people, with all these things as a package deal. And there's, there's no regard for, wait a minute, the organization is not an end in itself. It's a means to the end of the constituency. And so it, it shouldn't have locked in preconceived ideas of what it does forever into the future and and what it needs to be doing or how it needs to be doing. But so many of these things get locked in that it, and that's why the problem seems intractable. But the and a, and a good example of how the organizations see themselves as, as an end in themselves, if you ask a city, how's how's the local economy doing they're going to look at how much sales tax they're bringing in how much property tax they're bringing in they're going to look at the, the revenues that are coming into the city as a measure of the local economy and whereas wait a minute you're just recording what you've taken from the local economy that's not a sign you know that's not really the local economy but you see what i mean the the whole measure becomes what's going through the revenues of the city. And, and that right. you'll see the first thing on every financial st- sustainability plan in, in almost any public agency is increase revenues. Hmm. Because, because and you can understand why they do it, because it's too hard to unravel all the expenses when you're so tied into, but we've got to maximize services. We've got to keep doing this. So where are you going to go? Well, increase revenues. But what does that mean? That means increased taxes, increased fees. And that's what I mean by the problem isn't that that taxes and fees are too high. It's that they're always going to need to go higher and we'll, we'll never have good solutions promoted from the private sector or philanthropic sector if if the organizations tend, continue to monopolize in this way. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I wonder if this is the same as in California uh, California or Nevada, where you're at now. And You have a situation where in, in Texas, the local government, the appraisal office will send out the appraisals for you know property tax collections. They'll send those out early on in the year. And then over the summer, the local government will meet. They'll determine their budget and then they'll determine the rates, the property tax rates kind of after that process is over. But it's still being in some sense determined by, to your point, the amount of revenue, because the local governments also have to have a balanced budget, at least on paper. You know, there's other debt that's being issued and things of that nature. But but it kind of seems, you know, somewhat backwards in the sense that they're saying, okay, here's the appraisal amount for property tax collections that, you know, eventually, um, here's how much we want to spend. Now let's set the rate based on how much we want to spend instead of saying, okay, well, how much in revenue can we collect? 
and then that's how much we should spend. It seems a little bit backwards, but I wonder what your perspective is on that. Yeah, that works differently in different parts of the country. Some yeah. There's some areas where it's just it's a little more formulaic and in, and there isn't quite as much discretion as as you mentioned in Texas with with the setting of the rate locally balanced budget bottom line is is meaningless because all it means is we were able to put together a budget where the expenses do not exceed the revenues but but there's a a lot of things that go into that in terms of well what do you consider a revenue is it a current revenue from this year is it a draw from a reserve that's plugging a gap? And then, and then what you really have to look at is what's not being spent. And a lot of this has to do with maintaining the infrastructure, you know, what, uh, or, or paying down debt. What, what things should be spent but are not being spent in this balanced budget? So, the, so I don't think, I'll, I'll just maybe answer the question this way. I don't think you solve the problem by controlling revenues because well, the organizations with their mindsets and their struggle to maximize services are they're not going to cut in the areas that that you would want them to cut they're they're going to try to salvage they would rather go down trying to be everything to everybody than than really inventory their scopes and and fine tune what they do as organizations. So I, I don't think the starve them out really works in the long term. It, yeah. I see it more on the spending side of controlling spending, but but not just controlling spending by saying you can only spend so much because again some of that you know maybe there should be some money spent on some things that aren't being spent. So I think it goes back to the drivers of those costs. The drivers of the spending are the activities. The act. And that's all driven by how you design the scope of the organization. And so that's why I say it, it, I say it's all about scope. It all goes back to scope and delimiting. And one of the themes of my book is it's impossible to effectively manage or budget for an amorphous organization. And that's what these cities uh, and, and municipalities have become. They decide their scope from month to month or council meeting to council meeting. And, and the administrator can be a good juggler, but you can't really manage in that type of situation. Similarly, the budget, you can have a nice glossy budget book and you can have nice presentations, but what you're doing is, is not financial planning. It's not anything that looks like uh, financial planning. It's basically juggling. It's balancing it to get through this cycle and and then you have to deal with it again the following year. So yeah, I, I say it all goes back to the discipline to look at who you are. You're a legislative and enforcement body with all the rules and, and implications of that, which makes you good for some things and not for others. And you need to make decisions and it really needs to be okay to say no this is really outside our purview and i'll tell you i've in 30 years i only heard two times where an elected official pushed back on a proposal saying wait is this within our scope is this something we should be doing and that should not be some thing you only hear once every 10 or 15 years that should be something every council member or board member asks every time something new comes before them. And, yeah. and so that's that's the discussion that we're not having that we need to be having. Yep. No, I, I agree, Mark. And I think it, it reminds me of the zero-based budgeting approach. Is that is that kind of along the lines of what you're, well, what you're saying actually, here? That's a, I think that's a trap. Okay, <laughs> because, all, and right, here's, all right. And here's why. Because yeah. it sounds good, but... And people like to say they did it, but it doesn't work in local government when you've got a culture of maximizing services and you've mm. got all these political promises. Because I'll tell you exactly what happens because I've done it. Uh, and this is one thing I bring to the book is I'm not a theorist. I don't write white papers, but I, I know what I saw over the last 30 years and I think I can articulate it pretty well. And, and maybe help fill in some of the gaps for the economists and, and white paper writers out there. But when you sit down to do zero-based budgeting, 
what are you met with? Well, the first thing is, but we've got all these labor agreements. It's too late to change these. Those are all set. And, and that's not just setting compensation, because those labor agreements and public agencies not only tell you how much you're going to pay people, but it tells you how they're going to work. It has minimum staffing requirements in fire and police. It has all these other things that you would think would be management discretionary policies that are built into, codified in the MOUs. So you've already, and, and remember, 70, 80% of what you do is driven by the people you employ at this level. So now 70, 80% of your budget is already spoken for because you can't change what you pay people and you can't really change how you use them. It's too late by the time you sit down at, at budget season. So now it's like, what else is out there? Well, we've got these contracts. Well, we can't break these contracts now. Okay, throw those in. So now it's zero plus the MOUs is zero plus the contracts. And then there are these other things, but it's all too complicated. It's like, well, this is somebody's pet project here. Uh, we can't really unbundle that right now. It's too late to do this, too late to do that. So now your, your zero-based budget is all the way up to 99, and you're, you're right back to where you start when you do a regular budget, which is a, which is not really financial planning. It's it's yeah. essentially accounting for all the promises that were made that are too late to change. And and that's why uh, city council members, when they come on, they think they can have an impact right away. And they're, they're faced with, well, wait a minute. It's like, I don't have any discretion here. This train is moving too fast, too hard, too solidly. I, I can't stop it. And, and that's really what's, what's happening. And so it takes a long yeah. time. And then it becomes this vicious circle because once the budget finally gets adopted, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. And rather than say, oh, wait, the day after the budget's adopted is the best day to start working on things that could impact positively the next budget because it takes that long to work through. Everyone goes home for the summer and is kind of is so sick of budget and all right. things budget that by the time they come back to it, you're in the exact same place. And that's why zero-based budgeting it, it, and, and the GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, did a survey. And I think something like one out of over 400 agencies even, even pretended that they do zero-based budgeting. And I'd like to see the one who claims to do it. But the point yeah. is, everyone likes to talk about it. It sounds good. But for the reasons I described, it's it, it, it's not an effective game changer, it, and it okay. doesn't. And and we're back to it doesn't address the scope of activity. No, those are great points, and I think that it, it makes a lot of sense. I, I know when I was at uh, the Office of Management and Budget at the White House, there there was a situation where we would bring in program managers from across the different agencies to say, okay, why are you doing these things, right? And to have some sort of zero-based budgeting, I think to your point though, it, there never really was a start at zero because right. zero-based budgeting should be you start at zero and move your way up. Right. Um, but you at least you're going to have some continual spending uh, for for labor and contracts and other things like you mentioned there that already start out a, a higher level of the budget than just zero right. um, that you're going to go with. So there's almost like an inertia. There's inertia within the budget process that, to your point, though, is really well taken, is that we really got to focus on the, the scope and making sure that government stays within that scope to not go too far. And, and then if it is, those are the areas where we need to really start cutting. It's one of the reasons why, you know, over time, I've, I've been a big fan. I'd love to get your response of this, of, of spending limits. Um, to limiting the growth rate of spending to something. I mean, my preferred metric is population growth plus inflation because it's a good measure of the average taxpayer's ability to pay for spending. I'm not as worried about government appropriators, how much they need to spend necessarily, but whether the burden that's putting on the private sector uh, is a good measure to, to think about. Um, and it, that seems to work well at the state level. And I've done some work on that at the local level as well to try to put some of those in place. Uh, I know Colorado has some local spending limits there. 
uh, that they've weakened over time for a number of reasons. Um, but I, but I'm, but I'm, there's there's got to be something to come up with a more of a macro level because I get where you're at, Mark, of the more micro. If you think about it, the scope from the bottom up, in, in that sense, the problem is it's difficult to get grassroots and constituents excited about that part of it or even understand or even care about the budget. Whereas what I've seen over the years is if you come up with a, a number and saying, look, this is what we're not going to spend more than this. This is the threshold that we're at based on something like population and inflation. It gets the grassroots and it gets people at least to understand whether or not it's a responsible budget or not. Um, and, and so I wonder what, what your kind of your take is on spending limits at the at the local level. I like the spirit of it. I'm I'm suspicious of how well it works when you when it gets down to the grassroots because yeah. you know you can put these things in place but remember you have full-time city attorneys that are mm-hmm. trying to placate the council members and again these organizations see themselves as an end in themselves and as long as they see themselves that way they're going to resist these things and they're going to try to maneuver around them and and whether it's Okay, they'll stay within the limit, but they're not going to spend money on something that maybe they should spend money on. I, I think in, in the case of California, when they put limits on property tax, what happened? All these other sales tax add-ons come on, and 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 you have fees where you didn't used to have fees, and so you really have to keep your eye on the ball here. I, again, I go back to it's all about the scope, and 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 these other things can maybe help push the issue and support the issue, but they certainly aren't, oh, put it in place and walk away and think it's going to really do something. Because like the place you referenced, I guess, Colorado, where you say, oh, it worked for a while and unraveled. Well, yeah, look at why it unraveled. It unraveled because the, the top down doesn't work if it's not complemented by a change in culture and orientation at the grassroots, at the bottom. And I, yep. I, I think back to the zoning is a, a mm-hmm. archetype example, right? It's like, as long as you have the the nimbyism, the protectionism at the local level, it's like, you know, you just replaced larger scale cronies with local cronies, right? And local dictators, and that's no better. Uh, and, and in some ways it's more insidious to, to have the restrictions controlled from within with with the local interests and so that's one thing that this is about fleshing out is what i characterize as local cronyism that's enabled by the proliferation of scope well we're about running out of time mark but i uh, i think we've covered a lot of the key areas i mean there's some other things too that we could probably go into of the local debt uh we touched on a little bit of that uh, but also the unfunded liabilities of, of a lot of these uh, pension plans at the local level. Uh, we see those things as well. But I, but I really think we've given the audience a, a good taste and flavor and a lot of good things to think about when it comes to local government, that the scope is important. And, and we've really got to make sure that we're staying within the realm of what the government role should even be. So but before we close, I wanted to give you some a chance to provide any last words that you would like to say uh, here for the audience. Yeah, well, uh, I'm really just getting started with this since the book was just published earlier in the year. And one of my marketing challenges in the book is nobody's expecting a book like this. Hmm. And so for I'm not trying to convince people that aren't interested in local government policy that they should be. But if you're not and you know someone who is, please pass on the information if you are. Uh, there's more information on me, my website, munifinanceguy.com. That's muni is in municipal, financeguy, G-U-Y.com. I'm on Twitter, trying to build up Twitter presence, at munifinanceguy. And so uh, you can reach out to me through my website or uh, mark at munifinanceguy.com. And I'm happy to interact with people that are interested in, in this area. Uh, there are over 100,000 cities across the country, and I know it's not just in California, it's not just in Texas, it's everywhere. And I was really surprised at that. I thought, oh, some of these Midwestern states, they're more conservative, they're not going to have these problems. And the feedback I get is, no, they're out of control too. They keep trying to increase their scope at the local level of what they do, and they get over and they overwhelm themselves. So, uh, 
Yeah. So yeah, really happy to talk with you uh, today, Vance. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mark, for being on the Life People Prosper show. Um, I'll make sure to put the links and other information on the show notes page, um, which will be on my newsletter, www.vanceskin.substack.com. Uh, but this will also be posted on other podcasts as well, wherever you want to find it, wherever you listen to it at. Uh, but Mark, thank you so much. Thank you for being a, a happy warrior uh, in this fight to really rein in local governments. And so that way people have more um, opportunity to have liberty and have prosperity because we need we need more of that overall. Uh, but thank you so much for being on the Left Field Prosper Show. Um, God bless you, and, and I hope that you'll continue to have more success in everything that you're you're doing. So thank you so much. All right, thanks again, Vance. All right, well, thank you again for listening to the Left Field Prosper Show. I hope you have a prosperous day. Until next time, see you then. Mm-hmm.